AP Biology, Chapter 43, Part 4. Now we're going to go into some information about how B cells are, are involved with the third line of defense, which is specific against one invader. Here we have different B cells. Remember, you have millions of types of B cells, each with different uh, receptors on them for different antigens that can um, be bound to. Here we have an antigen. It could be from a virus, let's say, uh, floating in the uh, fluids, the humoral uh, part of your blood. And only this uh, B cell here is going to recognize that antigen. They're very specific, and that's why it's the third line of defense. All these other B cells will not be able to bind to that antigen. So all these little binding points are just a little bit different from all these B cells. All right, so the first step here is the antigen binds with a B cell. And then the B cell is triggered to make lots of clones of itself. And remember, clones are just genetically identical copies. And each one of these copies will be able to bind to the antigen. Understand why this is a benefit. If you're invaded by a virus with this antigen, then the B cells that will respond to that virus will start making copies of themselves so they can fight it off. All right, so now we have a bunch of clones of the B cells. We have thousands of clone cells. This is a great example of positive feedback, where if you have an antigen that results in cloning, which results in uh, more B cells binding to more antigens, that results in more cloning. So this is a good example of positive feedback. We don't see that as much as negative feedback in nature. All right, the clones uh, can become one of two types of cells. They can be their memory cells, or they become plasma cells. Memory cells are just going to be hiding in your blood, and if that antigen comes back, then, um, then you'll be ready to fight it. As we're going to talk about with vaccines, um, their response to the second invasion is much, much quicker than your response to the first invasion. The first invasion takes about 10 to 17 days to mount an effective response. Also, this is one reason why you don't get uh, chicken pox again, typically. You make memory cells for the chicken pox, and then if you get chicken pox later in life, those memory cells uh, clone themselves and fight off the chicken pox before it causes disease most of the time. Plasma cells uh, release antibodies, and we talked about how uh, antibodies do their job. Uh, antibodies will agglutinate or bind to the antigens and uh, clump them up, making it easier for the white blood cells to gobble them up. They also will be involved with the complement system of proteins to put holes in uh, cells if it's uh, bacteria that we're fighting off. And we can do other things like uh, precipitate out and, um, and bind to active sites with uh, antibodies as well. So keep in mind, the B cells don't actually go after the uh, the virus or the bacteria or whatever's in your body directly. They have more of an indirect role by producing antibodies, but that's still highly effective in suppressing the uh, uh, invaders because um, of the, the role of antibodies. All right, let's go ahead and review this step by step. Step one, B cell uh, specific to an antigen binds to it. Step two, thousands of clones of that B cell are made. Step three, those clones become memory cells for future attacks or plasma cells to make antibodies. You may want to sketch this out or you can pause at this point and hit print screen and then print out a copy in your notes. All right, take a minute to explain this. All right, the primary versus secondary response to disease. Now, the primary response is going to take longer for your body to respond to an antigen or an invasion. So let's take a look here. We have our first exposure to an antigen. Let's say it's, um, I don't know, the flu virus. And about uh, six, seven days later, you're going to start to make more and more clones of those B cells. And at about 14 days later, you've got tons of antibodies or a, a fair amount of antibodies in your body. But that took 14 days. By that time, the flu has already been uh, multiplying in your cells, taking over your cells, and that's why you feel sick. But eventually, your body kind of, you know, kicks up the antibodies into high gear and suppresses that flu virus, and the flu goes away. Now you have the antibodies uh, in your body, but uh, the antibodies are going to stay around. The thing that is going to stay around are the memory cells, and they're going to be really important here. Take a look here. Let's say the same flu attacks you, say, a month later. Well. Um, after a month later, 
you've already got those memory cells made, and those memory cells can rapidly divide and make lots and lots of copies very, very quickly, clones that can become plasma cells. And these plasma cells will release lots of antibodies. So the second invasion, you're going to have a, a, a very strong response to that uh, flu virus and kick its butt even before it causes disease. Now, this is how vaccine works. What vaccines do is give you a partially destroyed virus, like the flu virus, and forces your body to make memory cells. Now, they're making antibodies to the partially destroyed flu virus in the vaccine, but um, it's not doing anything because a, a partially destroyed virus is not going to cause disease. You just get that vaccine and uh, you start making memory cells. Now that you have a lot of memory cells in your body, when you get the real flu virus, then those memory cells can kick out lots of antibodies and you don't get the flu. This is how vaccines work. The vaccines themselves are not actually fighting the disease. The vaccines are tricking your immune system into thinking it's under attack so that you make memory cells so that when you get the real attack, then you're ready and you're prepared. So if you get like the HPV vaccine, you make your memory cells, even though you make antibodies to the partially destroyed HPV virus. Once you have those memory cells, if you get the real HPV virus, you're protected. You're going to produce enough antibodies before it can cause disease. Now, here's the problem with things like viruses. They mutate quickly. So if that flu virus that you uh, were exposed to before mutates and is no longer recognized by your immune system, or if some other invader attacks you, then you have to start the whole process over again. And you have to go through the primary response, which will take about 7 to 14 days to build some memory cells and make antibodies. All right, review the difference between the primary and secondary response to disease and how vaccines are made. All right, vaccinations, uh, write this down. This is active immunity. We're going to talk about passive immunity later. What active immunity means is that your immune system is triggered or uh, stimulated to produce um, antibodies to the invader and memory cells. And that means your body will be actively defending against that invader for future attacks. And it's most successful against viral uh, diseases. Things like smallpox and polio have been mainly eradicated as a result of vaccinations triggering the immune system to produce B cells, memory cells, that will fight the real thing when people get it. That's called active immunity. You get the vaccine, partially destroyed virus, or whatever it is you're trying to fight off. Seven to 14 days later, you can make enough memory cells, and then the secondary response will kick the virus's butt. Even if you get sick normally, uh, like chickenpox without a vaccine, the same thing happens. First time, the virus spreads, and then eventually you hopefully fight it. And um, later on in life, if you get chickenpox again, the secondary response B cells protect you. All right, so now this is passive immunity. And this is not quite as good as active immunity because you have to constantly be getting more, you're having some outside source of uh, protection. And that means your body won't be stimulated to make its own B cells and memory cells for future protected protection. So this is only short-term immunity. But there are some reasons why we do this. The person receives antibodies only. We should write this down for passive immunity. And it's only temporary. Make sure you know that. For example, uh, mom makes antibodies and passes it into the breast milk and then the kid gets those antibodies and is protected from the same things mom's protected against. But if that kid ever stops breastfeeding, they're not going to have those antibodies anymore. And if they get the virus or whatever else they have antibodies protecting them against, they're going to get that disease. Um, here's another thing that uh, works is, is for uh, snake bites. Let's say you uh, get bitten by a rattlesnake, and it's really important to try to identify the species, uh, hopefully even capture the animal, because what they do to make antivenom is they get rabbits and they inject them with snake venom. And then the rabbit produces B cells that make antibodies. And then they pull out some of the blood from the rabbit, separate out the antibodies from the rest of the body, and now you have your antivenom. What those antibodies from the rabbit do is bind to the, the venom, the poison, the proteins from the snake. And once it's locked up, the active sites aren't able to affect the nervous system, and you've basically neutralized the poison. So you're making a neutralization uh, substance when you are talking about antibodies and um, and this is a type of passive immunity so how do you recognize yourself from non-self and the only thing i want you to know is that you have these uh, proteins on the outside of your cells called mhc mhc are a series of proteins that will identify you as you if you don't have the right mhc like in a tissue transplant let's say you had to transplant a hand or uh, some other organ 
Uh, if it's too different, your body will recognize the MHC as foreign and attack that. So if you have the right MHC from your body or the right major histocompatibility complex of proteins, then, um, then you will be uh, able to uh, not attack your own body. However, anything outside your body is going to have a different MHC, so that's recognized as foreign, and you would have to suppress the immune system uh, in order for the immune system not to attack those cells. This, by the way, develops when you're very young to mark the, uh, your cells off limit from your immune system. And we're going to move on. Don't worry about MHC uh, 1 and 2. We're not going to talk about that. You should know what it does in general. It's a series of proteins on outside your cells that determine self from non-self, identifying you as you from your immune system. All right, T cells. Now, this is the other part of the third line of defense. This is cell mediated immunity, so we're going to be going after the cells, not after just parts of stuff uh, in the floating in the fluid or viruses floating in the, the liquid of your blood. Viruses and bacteria within the cells, fungi, protozoans, parasitic worms, all made of cells, defense against non-self cells. So let's go and write that down. Also, cancer and transplant cells will be attacked by T cells. Now, T cells, uh, some T cells will actively destroy uh, enemy cells or cancerous cells, which are your own cells that are kind of uh, abnormal. There's two types of uh, T cells that you should know about. There's helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells. Cyto, cell, toxic, deadly to. This is the one that actually can kill other cells cytotoxic T cells. Helper T cells don't kill other cells, but they do help the other parts of your immune system that we'll talk about now. All right, so how does this work? Well, let's say we have an um, uh, invading bacteria, and this is where we have the macrophages involved uh, a lot in the third line of defense. Remember, the second line of defense just has the macrophages kind of um, roaming around in the wandering patrol, gobbling up invaders. However, in this uh, third line of defense, what ends up happening is bacteria are taken up by a macrophage, and the macrophage uh, becomes an APC. Now, in the Army, they stands for Armored Personnel Carrier. But in this case, it stands for Antigen Presenting Cell, and it's what it's going to do. The macrophage is going to present an antigen from the bacteria on the outside of its cell. What's going to happen next is the helper T cell will recognize this chemically using interleukins. I'm not going to test you on the interleukins, but inter means between, leuk means white. This is between white blood cells, interleukin, between white blood cells. This white blood cell is going to send chemical signals to this white blood cell to trigger it to do some things. All right, so the helper T cell becomes activated by the APC. Uh, presenting antigens, and then the helper T cell is going to activate the cytotoxic T cells to make clones of themselves as well as go after and destroy any of those bacteria that have the same antigen. It's also going to activate the B cells so that we can make antibodies to bind up those bacteria as well. So those helper Ts activate both the B cells and the T cells to destroy invaders. All right, let's go and write this down. Stimulated by the body cells reactions to invaders that's going to make the macrophage into an APC, antigen presenting cell, presents the antigen on the outside, releasing interleukin, that's not as important, and then that's going to activate the helper Ts. The helper Ts, there's a signal transduction pathway basically triggering DNA to make proteins. They're going to release something called interleukin-2 between white blood cells 2 to activate T cells and B cells. Cytotoxic T cells, cell uh, killers, kill infected body cells, they bind to an infected cell, and they produce proteins called perforin. Think perforations on a paper. They're going to put holes in the enemy and destroy it, causing apoptosis, and that's the job of cytotoxic T cells. I'm going to jot down a few notes for this. Here we have a cytotoxic T cell releasing perforin, putting holes in a cell and destroying it. And they can do this with cancer cells too. T cells can destroy cancer cells, B cells can't. All right, let's go ahead and review this, and this is a good summary of B cells and T cells in the third line of defense. Here's some uh, tables here we can kind of look at. Antigen exposure, free antigens in the fluid, humoral response, B cells produce plasma cells that make antibodies and memory cells for later invasions. Macrophages will become antigen presenting cells once they're exposed to an antigen. Activate helper T cells, which will activate B cells as well as T cells. Um, HIV attacks helper T cells, so that's why uh, it's so devastating. It shuts down the rest of the immune system. T cells, activated by helper T cells or direct exposure by antigens, will become memory T cells and, more importantly, cytotoxic T cells that will actually put holes in uh, 
invading cells with uh, proteins called perforin. All right, let's go ahead and read through this. These are some autoimmune diseases where your own body attacks itself. Go ahead and pause at this point. This ends uh, part four of your notes on chapter 43, the immune system.